<laughs> Thank you, um, Shelley, very much for the invitation, and it's my uh, privilege and honor to be here. I'm Amanda Teagarden, and as she said, I'm the Executive Director of OK Safe. And we were formed in late 2006, and we didn't know what we were doing, but we were advocating for the people at the state capitol. And it was our first foray into actual lobbying. So what we've evolved into, even though we don't support evolution, but what we've grown into <laughs> is to issue, advocate, and lobby the Oklahoma legislature on issues that have to do with limited government, the rights of the individual, those kinds of things. Well, we didn't start out addressing health care reform because that was not our particular issue. We were uh, addressing other things. But it turned out about three years ago, or almost four now, health care reform became the issue that affects each and every one of us. So what we did uh, was I spent five months reading and studying the Affordable, the Unaffordable Care Act. And what I found was that everything else that I'd researched up to that time was connected to this. Basically what we're seeing is the complete reinvention of government. The complete reinvention of health care, uh, the delivery of health care in this country, and we are moving towards socialized medicine, which nobody here should be very surprised about. The, what we're actually seeing is this health care reform had nothing to do with health care. It had everything to do with redefining what insurance coverage is and moving insurance for health care to a public-private partnership between the government and the insurance providers with the ultimately the insurance health insurance companies moving into reinsurance. So this is what other countries do with socialized medicine. The government pays for it. And so before when the, the prior speakers were talking about, you know, here we are, we have all this problems because of Obamacare. Well, we have problems in health care because the government got involved where they have no business. Right. It is not free market. Yes. It is not for a long time it hasn't been free market. It's free market. The government gets out of the way. The health, the hospitals actually charge a reasonable rate for the services that they're providing. And they don't have all of this back and forth with the funding and the nonprofit and all these other kinds of things. Uh, Dr. Keith Smith from the Surgery Center in Oklahoma City has a great point about the hospital associations who all claim to be nonprofit. They all got cranes in the air for building and expansion. So something is not actually correct. I um, got into this but I found health care reform did not start with the Unaffordable Care Act. It started out over a couple of decades. And it took pieces and pieces to put this thing together. The exchanges and the Affordable Care Act that they were uh, creating the exchange system, the method of inserting a middleman into a market where it's normally between you and the doctor or you and the insurance company, that's uh, an agreement between two parties. The exchange system inserts a third party. A third party. You have to go through the exchange either for the information, your health information, or for your <coughs> coverage, the payer. So the magic triangle, and I'll show you a, a slide on here, is the thing that you're looking for that connects, that makes all of Obamacare work, <coughs> and this redesign is the connection between the patient, the provider, and I'll show you this, and the payer. So you've got three Ps connected like this into a technology triangle. That is Obamacare. That's the sum total of it. All right? This payer is the insurance company or is the state. The patient is you. The provider could be the doctor, the lab, the pharmacy, uh, whoever is providing a component of health care reform. So the objective of the uh, Affordable Care Act and the stimulus bill was to create the technological infrastructure to connect these three. It's a big IT project, okay? So here we are. That's the last drawing on the board. All right, so now we're going to see if this works. Healthcare reform defined. Here we are all talking about healthcare reform, and one thing I have learned is if you don't define the terms, we could actually be talking about two different things. Or there's a legal definition and there's a general public's impression of what the definition is. So if you don't start out with the definition of terms, you guys are going to appear to be agreeing or appear to be disagreeing, but especially if you're talking to a politician, you have to define the terms. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> Healthcare reform. No one knows that. It's, le it's law. All of this is law. It's contracts. This is law. It's not general terms. It's legal terms. 
Healthcare reform is really about the use of IT. IT is information technology. Everything is moving toward an app or an online or electronic this and electronic that. If we're talking about security and privacy, what is the most secure and the most private way of discussing your health issues or having any kind of conversation with somebody? Not putting your own Is it electronic? No. Yeah. No. Once you go into the electronic zeros and ones, zeros, zeros, zeros and ones world, you've lost all security. That is easily hacked, easily transmitted, it is insecure by its nature. It's electrical impulses, either you see them or you don't see them, mostly you don't see them. It's wired or wireless, and it's all it is, zeros and ones. Everything about us is being expressed in digital code and transmitted. It is, by its nature, vulnerable. But they're going to tell you it's very secure. It isn't. The piece of paper that TC has in his pocket right now is more secure than anything that the federal government has put online. All right. So there's that. Electronic health records. This whole thing only works because of electronic health records. We've moved toward those efficient electronic health records. Um, not all of these are bad because you may have a practice, a doctor that says, I've moved my practice from paper to electronic. Hopefully he's kept all of his paper files because what happens with electronic goes down. All right. And nobody can steal 30,000 paper records in one half hour sweep. They could steal and do or hack into 30,000 electronic health records in one fell swoop. That's target. Target, 40 million, okay? Electronic, digital money. All right, cradle to grave. Now some people keep their electronic systems within their office just to make it efficient, but they're not attached to a network outside of the building. That's good, all right? And I have computers in my house, but you're not attached somewhere else. Cradle to grave, electronic health records now start with the birth, it actually starts with prenatal, starts with the child's birth, which now your birth certificate is quite long, it's your child's first dossier, and continues to death records, which are electronic format now. So there's a complete electronic picture of you from birth to <coughs> cradle to grave, uh, electronic format. Uh, electronic health records are universal and to be shared globally. Now, earlier you talked about portability. There's advantages and there's disadvantages because with the portable insurance comes the portable electronic health records. Be careful what you wish for. If you want it on a thumb drive that's portable with you and the other state recognizes that you have Blue Cross Blue Shield and that's fine, but those records are with you somewhere on your person, that's one kind of portable. The other one is it's between you and New York or you and China. There it is, okay? Be careful what you wish for. Require standardization and interoperability. All of the computer systems that are the standards that which the electronic health record companies have to adopt are uh, global in nature. It's global XML and they have global standards, which are international standards because the object is we are a mobile workforce and you may move from here to China and you want to be able to take your health records with you. Whatever. And that's not on, on, you know, there's people coming here from other countries uh, on the EB-5 visa program. We've got all kinds of people. We, we're switching around where the mobile workforce goes. You want it to be portable, everything about you. Uh, we're moving toward genetic information on the electronic health record, and that starts with birth when they take a blood sample. Rights killing. Healthcare reform and other data collection networks do an end run around search warrants to nullify your inherent rights to life, liberty, and property. I don't know how we'll ever get around this because everybody's volunteering for the electronic records. I got a new job. I don't know how to do anything other than through the electronic method because that's what they want. And that's how that, that functions. That's the time that we're living in. That is the time we're living in. So I'm looking at it's like what I can do is encrypt my computer to the best of my ability to protect what I have on that computer and sharing with others going to be encrypted. Because uh, actually I got my insurance license. And I am not going to be selling health insurance. Okay. Um, I am certified on the federal, federal facilitated marketplace. I took all of those tests online. I can tell you. The software program, the company that did the software training is Meridian Global. And the company that actually provides healthcare.gov is ICG. It's a Canadian company that screwed it all up. They which got fired. They fired. They got, of course they got fired. And it's like, cha-ching, did they give us a refund? 
They did not give you a refund, but they did get fired. The reason we opposed the health insurance exchange at the state level is because the feds couldn't put it together without the states working out all the kinks. Our state was earmarked to get $54 million to set up the IT infrastructure to connect all of these agencies and with the feds. The feds are involved because to verify your income, they have to connect to the IRS. To verify your citizenship, they, they connect to the Department of Homeland Security. To verify um, the IRS, Social Security Administration, to verify that your uh, Social Security number is you, all right? And I can tell you, I went through all that testing, and I'm looking through it because I look through things with the IT uh, worldview. Uh, I'm not an expert on it, I just understand it, is that this whole thing is vulnerable. There is absolutely incredible. And by the way, the way I, no offense here anyway, but the training program was heavily skewed with pictures, and I'll tell you, those pictures were very pretty men, walking little tiny dogs at the park. Okay. <laughs> Draw your own conclusions. Okay. All right. Um. <laughs> they're really, that's a, that's a demographic that they're going after is to get those who are engaged in certain types of uh, acts, yeah, lifestyles to, to sign up. Anyway, Obamacare. Deja vu, it's 1992 all over again. I was doing some research at the Capitol, went down there and found a newspaper clipping from 1992 in the files. And here it is, by golly, it's like, this looks familiar. This is what we're calling Obamacare, 1992. Who was there? It was Hillary who was president, right? Okay, so now we got Hillary, Hillary Care, and here's the vision. Now what was also happening in the early 90s, the internet, NAFTA, sustainable development, globalization. I thought it was amazing, as soon as Obama got into office, bam, there was the 2,000 plus pages of Obamacare. Like the Patriot Act and all this other stuff, it was written a long time, they waited for a certain incident. In this case, what they're waiting for is the development and the maturing of the internet and people's acceptance of it and the use of it and getting all the kinks worked out of the system so that it is more um, all over the place. What are those trees that are all over the place? Anyway, it's like it's everywhere and people are using it. You're volunteering to use it. We all do. All right, so here was their 1992 vision is that yeah, corporations, government, small business, self-employed would be routed through a co-op that collects the premiums. That would be now called an exchange. Okay, sales, ch state chartered, nonprofit organizations serve specific re uh, regions, all right? So now you have government and self-employed, everybody filters through that, and then you have your choice of health plans. Can you picture bronze, silver, gold, platinum, and the co-ops, provide, must offer the same comprehensive benefit package, that's essential health care. Why you can't keep your plan is if they didn't meet the 10 requirements for it, because now everybody's got to fit into the same. You know why they're doing that? Because you can't have diversity with the computer software system. It has to channel you into repeatable fields of information. It's all computer based, and if you understand data collection systems and fields, entering in fields into um, a big spreadsheet, you can't have a great variety in custom-made health plans. You have to have it where they can track it by particular categories. So they moved everything. You have to have 10 degrees, 10 levels of service. So here, that's what they were um, strategizing before. Member can't be excluded for pre-existing condition. You have to take everybody. Okay. Uh, plans can be super uh, health maintenance organizations or networks of doctors and hospitals. This is all moving toward a network where data is shared electronically between this network. I'll get to who's putting that together. There's another exchange. And then you have also covered by unemployed, uh, needs to cover the unemployed and the poor. And a member can select the plan he or she wants, just like you do on the exchange. Picking a doctor's service not included in plan, plan costs more. That's exactly what we have. This was envisioned a long time ago. It didn't start with, what's his name? <laughs> All right, so now what we have when we go to the doctor, and I, I, I'm not telling people don't go to the doctor. You still have to go to the doctor. Just be aware that when you go to the doctor, that they, if they are part of a network, they are sharing that information, not only with the hospital and everybody that's in there, is that they're also sharing it with state agencies, uh, reports, and of course it's all DC identified. And they also share it with research universities, and that would be in our state, would be OUF, OSU, and others. And then it's shared with the pharmaceutical companies who get access to data, again, de-identified, but access also probably to samples 
they are going to create a product and sell it back to you. You pay for every bit of this. Now, if the free market was operating, I'd say, okay, now I'm a corporation, you're gonna buy everything off of me that you're buying. That's not gonna happen, but that's really, you're the source of all this profit. <clears throat> Just think about that. They should pay you. Okay, the real health care reform bill, if you want to look at it that way, was the stimulus bill. And I'm hurrying. Uh, the High Tech Act. The stimulus bill had all this money in there for the technology systems. And the High Tech Act was the stimulus bill, allowed the money for the electronic health record adoption. All right, so now they have agencies in the state that are spending out the vouchers to help providers adopt electronic health records to the benefit of some people on the trust. Okay. These are all the sections of the Unaffordable Care Act that were IT based. All these sections. It had a reporting mechanism or, to, or uh, something else that it was IT based. You strip that out, you strip the bill. That's why I say it was IT tech to the benefit of the technology system. The exchange, the magic formula when we were looking at whatever the piece of legislation was to see whether we were support or oppose it, the exchange bill was the magic triangle connecting in one electronic network, network, patient, provider, and payer. That's all you had to look for, and then you would know to oppose it. Since 2004, our state has been implementing, and prior to this as well, the different parts and components of something we call Obamacare, the Unaffordable Care Act. So you continue all the way through here, and there are other things that don't seem related. So we have a lot of legislators say, I didn't know what we were, we were building. They were building a huge machine. They were building the infrastructure to make Obamacare work, not just here, other states, so that it could be launched and fail in 2013. <laughs> so anyway, but you create, one of them said, now you can create a constituency that exists forever, now you gotta feed the beast, all right? This all started because government got involved where it shouldn't be involved. So now we have these monstrosities, these bureaucracies that we have to support. So anyway, you can see that, that's what it is. Now what's this happening to stop Obamacare penalties now is that there's an effort that's coming up through this legislative session, like prior two years, to start to undo some of these components. There's going to be grief. There's going to be objection. There's going to be say, people saying the Ohio Trust is going to say, there's no getting the horse back into the barn. Everybody's adopted electronic health records, etc. You've got to try. All right. StopObamacarePenaltiesNow.com, that's the website. This is this group we're very much supporting with Bob Donahue and these other people are doing. He's going to talk to you about some, I think, aren't you? Okay, the specific pieces of legislation that you're going to work with. The reason for those pieces of legislation, it may seem a little odd, but because you've got to go take back, reverse some of the components of the infrastructure. What you can do in the meantime, scripture says get your house in order. That means get your health in order. Do what you can to not need that system. Just what you can. Right. All right? That's all you can do in, in the time that we're living in is do what you can to not need it. All right? And that's the great wor uh, words of wisdom. That's all I have. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Let me ask a question I know that you can answer. What does single payer mean? What does that mean? That would mean, uh, this is my understanding of it, because there's different definitions of it. This is my understanding, is that you have a government-sponsored uh, insurance plan, and everybody's got the same. And the government is the one uh, guaranteeing the payment to the hospital. So it's a partnership between the hospital and the government for payment. It's kind of like everybody's on Medicaid, or everybody's on Medicare, what they're calling socialized medicine. Now, the government doesn't have enough money to pay all of those insurance claims, obviously, so there's where the insurance companies come in, the, the uh, health insurance companies come in. They've moved, they are moving because they see the direction we're heading. So they're moving into reinsurance, so they would be offering the insurance to the government who's the payer. So if the government doesn't have the money, then they, they get their, uh, they make a claim to the insur their insurance, and that pays the claim. All right, so it's insurance by the government reinsurance by the private sector. I don't know if it's going to work. By the way, the reason we're doing this is because the insurance company saw 70 million baby boomers coming in to the time of their life where they needed a lot of health care. There's going to be a lot of ka-ching, ka -ching payout. <coughs> so they needed more people to buy insurance. All right, it's just a matter of numbers. All right, 
Any other questions? Yes, sir. This works, that model works well if it's done by private enterprise. Kaiser Permitte out in California has that same model. They have uh, their own clinics, they have their own insurance company, and they have their own hospitals. They have people coming in on a regular basis and they're checking it in to make them sure their health is where it should be and they're keeping them out of the hospital by catching it before they need to go. And that model works well in private enterprise. I don't think it will work well with the federal government. Well, it won't work well in federal, federal government, government, government is because work. people are all going to be paying. My children, my youngest is 21, my daughter is uh, 28. And she and her husband just had their first child. I, I despaired after I read the Affordable Care, Affordable Care Act. I despaired of them ever actually owning their home because they're living in a very expensive America. So you're right, it would work. And all of this started when the government started to get into regulating, uh, interfere. Yes, sir. What we have to be aware of, too, is that if the government is running things, they are going to decide what health care you can get. And what yeah. health care you cannot get. Yeah. They're going to control everything. Yeah. Are you uh, no longer a productive worker <coughs> for the social, the, for the state? Then we're going to minimize the not amount of care, right. the Liverpool protocol or whatever. So I see gray hair on your head. I think maybe your usefulness to society is diminishing, so we'll give you comfort care and send you home. Mm -hmm. All right, that's but it. You'll, you'll not even have improved medical treatment in a lot of areas because it's something the government doesn't approve. Yes. You're going now, to be stuck. Now, because <coughs> we have a high degree of suzerainty, which means we have a backbone, but we, we, say, we would say, screw that, <laughs> and you go do something else. I'll get health care in another way. I'll get out the books and learn how to do the darn treatment myself. Yeah. Universities sell the textbooks. Who says they have to control the entire Sector. You cannot get health care anywhere else? Are you kidding? This is America. They are trying to uh, put controls on uh, supplements and uh, a lot of natural products. Mm -hmm. They're trying to, uh, a lot of organics, they've already put controls on it and they're trying to make it so you can't, for instance, buy raw milk and there's a lot of things along those lines. Absolutely. All right. I see a roadblock. What do you think first, though? How do you get around? Okay. Yes, sir. Well, well with, oh. the or, with the organic thing, you don't want to buy USDA organic. Yes. Yeah. That's government organic. Yeah. You want to buy real, true organic, and go to the farmer or grow right. yourself. Yes. You can grow mint in your backyard, you can grow all kinds of stuff. And there's always way, and what I said here is when you see a roadblock, what's the first thing? I don't know, maybe it's the rebellion that's in. <laughs> I was a good kid, too. Uh, you go around and say, okay, why is that roadblock there? Well, who's preventing me from doing what I need to do? There's more of us than there are of them. There are more of us, all right? And that the talent and the, and the brain trust is there's in the youth, but there's also in the middle-aged people in this country. They need us, all right? Civil disobedience can include a lot of different things, and I'm not talking any kind of thing that's violence, but if you don't go pay them, and if you don't participate and swim in their little cesspool, what are they gonna do? There's all, all kinds of ways that you can get real creative about thinking about how I'm gonna go around. I have not been to the doctor. I tried my very best. My husband is a frequent flyer. so. So we got different, different, different makeups here, but he's, he's, he's like a type A and I'm not. So he, he does things, but there are certain things that you can do. I know that that is not a good place to go. Uh, I had to get a, a mammogram and that's the last one I'm going to get. There's a bunch of nice ladies in there, but you go in there and I'm immediately insulted because there's some winged bust of uh, uh, no head, just the torso and wings, this big plastic thing that's like, my got to put a tablecloth on that thing. And you got older gentlemen in there with their wives who can't hear very well, and they're having to say, well, when did this happen? Out loud. And it's just it's just demoralizing. And it's like, and you have to get in there. And I said, I don't want my record shared. So they put me in a special room. 
and the, the lady that was from the uh, finance department or whatever had to come visit me and said that if you do not, then we will have to send you home. So I was stuck because I didn't have a plan B and I should have had a plan B to begin with. And uh, I sat there for 10 minutes before I agreed. I shouldn't be in that position. If I don't want my records shared with anybody, that should be my right. We're paying them for that service and I don't want them shared. Couldn't get the service. So uh, I, I had a good result, and that was fine. I, I vowed I'm never going to do that again. I'll figure out some sort of a natural way to take care of whatever it is to the best of my ability. You know, if you've got a broken leg, you've got to go get it set. If you have certain things happen, some things you can't take care of yourself. I'm not giving medical advice here. You do what's right for yourself, but Scripture says get your house in order, and that includes this house right here. So as best we can, take care of ourselves so we don't have to go into that. And in the meantime, we fight it. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.